if you want to change the world for good. So I was a 10-year-old growing up in India, and you would see poverty, inequality at close quarters. While I grew up in a middle-class family and had the basics there, I wasn't uh, fed with any silver spoons, but I, I used to struggle. I, was, I would dream at night and think about maybe there would be a magic wand that I would use and take away the inequality, poverty, and suffering in the world. I could not understand that people who had enough, why couldn't they just give the stuff that they did not want to those who did not have it? I was lacking the mental tools as a 10-year-old. I was lacking a paradigm to look at the world and the way it operates. I was considered a gifted artist, and my family, my friends, everyone who knew me thought I will go to fine arts, uh, uh, an art school, but I decided to go study economics. I understood that early on that the world goes around on money, and that the understanding of the economy and the way that world works is fundamental to a subject like economics. And thus began a quest in order to change the world and find out those tools and that information that's necessary in order to understand it and hence affect change. I found out that our very understanding of reality, of the world around, is essentially fragmented. So David Bohm is one of the, uh, the best known modern philosophers on reality, existence, and its intersection with consciousness. And there's this beautiful quote from Bohm. He talks about how the way thoughts are pervaded for differences as well as distinctions um, leads us to the way we perceive the world, right? Which then seems to have these divisions. And so the way we see and the way we experience this world is actually broken up in fragments. And turns out it's not just a problem with our worldview. It's a problem with the very way science is done. It's, it's a problem with the way we raise kids, and so on and so forth. Now, let me ask you a quick question. What is the similarity, or what are some of the similarities between a school of fish that's swimming together and something like a financial crisis? Turns out, these two are a lot more similar than we realize. Both are actually good examples of complex systems, systems that are characterized by autonomous agents that largely operate without a central controller. Whether biological, physical, or social, we live in a network world where different parts and interactions between these agents cause what we know as emergent properties of the system, uh, properties that could not be foreseen. And this is the beauty of complexity. I learned about complex science in Italy um, from my professor on innovation economics uh, called Cristiano Antonelli, and he opened this world of a new science, a new paradigm to us. And I would sit at the front row and have totally fascinated. Wow, this is a completely different way to look at the world. This is not a world where there is a bucket of physics, a bucket of biology, a bucket of economics, and so on and so forth, but an integrated way to look at all of these together. And this is where I had this life-changing moment, and it has changed my personal life, it has changed my professional life, and ever since, I worked on complex science in one way or the other. So here's the powerful idea, and that is of networks. We all live in a networked world, a hyper-networked world, if you may. This is a partial map of the internet, and you can see how important it is to have networks as a fundamental basic tool and compare that to the general equilibrium models where we have a linear understanding of the way economies work in traditional economics to something like this. Now you may ask, what is the difference? Well, there are different nodes in the network. 
they, they might be largely independent. But the problem with traditional economics is the following. It does not account for the interactions between these nodes. And the interactions between these nodes are not a property of any one system. And that's why you see systems which are larger than the sum of its parts, where small perturbations in the system causes a larger impact, the so-called butterfly impact at the system level. And turns out, things like financial crisis, which are seen as black swan events, well, it turns out it's a very property of the system. It is nothing but expected that we would have occasions like this where these long tail events would occur. So I stumbled upon blockchain two years ago, and come to think of it, if, if I look at the larger arc of my professional life, it was actually not a coincidence. For the first time ever, we have a technology that is distributed and actually mirrors the way the natural world works. This is the way we have fractal patterns in, in the natural world, the way we see patterns in, on, on a zebra, in leaves. And turns out all social sciences and all of society, financial systems, so on and so forth, make the same patterns. But the problem with our current structures, our current economic institutions, is that they are centrally controlled, right? So there are few parties that collect all the economic rent for the contribution that an entire network is making. So in my capacity as a head of economic research and as a fellow at MIT, what we're trying to do is build this next generation of institutions that would mimic the natural world more than an artificially imposed centralized world. And here's the takeaway. If you're looking to do innovation, and if you're looking to change the world, this is a much better place to start. Thank you.